Okay, good um, evening, morning, afternoon, um, everyone. Um, hey, hi, Peter. Um, welcome to the stream. Uh, so this will most likely be the uh, last stream about the memory cache. Um, and so what I want to do today is basically take the... Um, hey, hi, Matthew. Um, yeah, good evening to you too. Um, what I want to do is take the cache that we uh, coded in the in the previous stream and wire it up into a system uh, on chip. And uh, <laughs> yeah, thank you. It's a little it's a little uh, too reflective for the camera, but uh, <laughs> that's the best I could do. It's my uh, lockdown ha uh, haircut. Um, so yeah, take the cache that we uh, coded and wire it up to uh, a PyCore V SOC a system on chip, run it and uh, and run it on uh, on the icebreaker. So I have, um, but oh, wait, I only have one camera. So uh, let me see if I can. Okay, so that's the icebreaker. Most people should be familiar with it, and. Um, what I have wired up to it is the um, quad uh, hyperam P mod, and so I wrote a, a an um, hyperam controller for this. Um, and what I want to do is basically use that memory and make it uh, accessible uh, to the Pico RV that's running uh, that will be running in the um, in the ice 40 yeah yeah it's still my my uh, my boat version there is a like the the small red wire is uh, like the chip select that I connected manually uh, th that green wire here is because I completely tore uh, one of the trays that I had to replace, like the, the UR transmit trays. I destroyed it, uh, and so I had to connect it back. <laughs> and then there is uh, the chip select for, uh, like, you can't really see it very well, but on there, above the flash chip, I connected um, uh, SPI PS RAM, and so that's the chip select for that. Um, Ideally, I'd like to uh, oh, actually give me a second. Uh, so at some point, what I'd like to uh, what I'd like to do in instead of using the hyper RAM is use the 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 PS RAM, the, the SPI PS RAM, and use it on this board. So that's. Uh, uh, icebreaker bitsy uh, and it has you know you can see that there are two chips stacked here uh, that's because there is the flash and the, I, I mounted a, a PS RAM uh, above it too and so I'd like to make that uh, uh, memory usable so I can run like uh, circuit Python or something that needs more than the 128 kilobytes of, um, of RAM Yeah, at the moment I'm not using it here. I'll be using the hyperam mostly because I have not uh, I have not yet coded the the, the SPI controller, um, and so yeah, I'm not gonna use that. But uh, the goal is to actually um, code a SPI controller that can talk to both the flash and the uh, PS RAM with the same interface. Um, as the hyperam controller, I mean on the internal FPGA side, I mean, and and have it run um, at four times the system frequency, so it would be running um, the flash and the um, uh, and the PS RAM at 96 megahertz, which would provide uh, a nice uh, a nice bandwidth. So I uh, I did prepare some things uh, because doing it, doing it uh, all on the uh, on the stream was a little uh, hard. So I already I've already wired up the 
Um, so that's the, oh wait, I need to switch to this, okay. So that's the, um, the repository where I have, where I do my development, and I currently have a dev branch where I uh, put the memory cache, the hyperarm controller, and all the st stuff that I'm currently working on, but it's not ready yet to merge to master. Um, and so, wait, no, that's not what I want to do. Uh, okay. So, there is, there was um, already a, a PyCo RV sock in there, an example, um, and I modified that uh, mostly to add the uh, add the hyperarm controller to the um, to the design. So these are the the main commits that I did to uh, to do this. Um, I'm just gonna quickly review them to show that it's not. So the first thing was just um, some uh, preparation work, mostly generate all the clocks that I need for the uh, hyperarm controller because I need a 24 megahertz clock, I need a 48 megahertz clock for the USB, then I need a 48 megahertz clock that has a variable phase shift for the hyperarm capture, and then I, I need a 96 megahertz clock for the hyperarm uh, IOs. And so I modified mostly the PLL configuration and stuff like that to generate all of that um, on an IS-40, which isn't really designed to handle that many clocks. <laughs> um, so that, that's the first change I did. The next one was basically just adding the hyperarm controller to the design. So, you know, I added to the uh, dependency of the project. Um, I, there is a... The hyperarm needs some special script, uh, Python script, to be run by next PNR because some of the um, some of the blocks inside need to be manually placed. I mean, automatically by that script, but I mean they're not placed by next PNR. It's a special script that takes care of them because um, the I/O timing of trying to run hyperarm fast on an icebreaker on an ice forty is a uh, Can I explain quickly what? Oh, to do phase control. Oh, um, yeah, sure. So, uh, the way it's implemented in... Um, let me go back to that commit. Uh, So the um, the, FF, the the PLL has uh, two things that you can change. Here, you can select if you want the the clock to either be um, zero degree or ninety degree. Um, however, that's um, a stat that's a compile time parameter. Like you, you you can't really change it dynamically. It's not entirely true because the ice 4 PLL actually has a special test mode where you can dynamically reconfigure the PLL uh, while the ice 4 is running, but you still have to reset the PLL itself. And because here the PLL is driving all the clocks, if I reset the PLL, the entire thing just stops. Um, so here are just selected um, statically. And then you also have um, the, this. Um, there is a special port where you can input a 4-bit value so that, uh, then you can add um, a variable delay on one of the clock by increment of about 150 picoseconds by, um, by delay. So you can add between 0 and 2 nanoseconds uh, on, the, uh, on this output, basically. Um, if we... Now... This has been written with the knowledge I had of the PLL um, at that time, but that has actually changed. Um, let me see if I can ice for the PLL line. Wait, did that open on this thing? Okay, so that's 
sort of what the pillar looks like. Uh, how do you zoom on this? Okay, uh, so the, the dynamic delay port uh, controls this, right? Which allows you to, to change the, the phase of a clock, basically. Um, I, it's, I actually want to draw uh, another diagram uh, from the PLL because that, that doesn't represent reality, basically. <laughs> Uh, and I want to draw one that actually represents how the PLL actually works because, well, first, it doesn't even show that there are several outputs, and there are things that you can do that the data sheet says you can't. Um, so I need to fix that, but yeah, that's for later. Um, so, yeah, I think the, the IPRAM controller. Uh, it's basically, you know, I think the pin in the PCF, there's really nothing. And then um, basically just instantiating the core and um, wiring it up to the main wishbone bus of the of the CPU. Uh, you can see that here I increment, I said that instead of six peripherals, I, I know I have seven. And I wired uh, this one on the, uh, the, the, the seventh port of the, the, wish, the wishbone bus, basically. Um, because the, the IPRAM controller has this, which is the memory interface, which is like the high speed interface to uh, read and write bursts, and it also has a wishbone port, which is not used to access the memory itself, but to configure the, 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 the controller. Because of the way IPRAM works, you need to do some training and stuff like that um, before you can actually read and write it. Um, and that's what's done here, that's just basically firmware to just configure the IPRAM controller itself and, and, uh, and drive it and do the memory training and, uh, and all that stuff. Although here the memory training is uh, just a static configuration, but I know it works. Um, and here I did, um, I prepared this sock, so let me draw a diagram of the current system on chip. Um, let's go with this. So the the way the the system on chip was before I started integrating the cache is something like this. Uh, wait, I need to. I have the Pico RV thirty two which has like a, it's, it's a special interface, it's not exactly wishbone, but it's, it's kind of close to it. And then I have something I've called bridge. And the bridge is kind of the first layer of dispatching of the, the memory requests. And it has three interfaces. Um, one is to a block RAM, and that's basically the boot, the boot code. Because you can't initialize the SP RAM in an ICE 40, which means I need some memory that I can pre-initialize so the Pico RV can boot off something, and that's what the BRAM contains. It's just contained. It's a very small. It's a. Uh, it's uh, what's one uh, K? I think. One kilobytes, um, and it contains a boot code that will read the main application from the SPI flash and load it into the SPRAM. So it has a second port which is uh, the SPRAM, and that's sixty-four kilobytes. Alternatively, it can also be one twenty-eight. Uh, it's something I can configure. Um, here I'm, I'm going to use 64 because I need the other 64 for the memory cache, right? Um, and then it has uh, one interface that kind of fans out into several, which connects to a bunch of peripherals, which are wishbone. And so on, on this you kind of find you find the, like the UART, 
you find uh, LED controller so you can blink stuff. You can, you find um, the SPI controller to talk to the flash. Um, and I'm and one thing that I've added is you find the uh, the IPRAM control interface. Now, this um, this wishbone bus is not very fast uh, because it goes to several peripherals and stuff like that. I've added several wait states, and so every access uh, can take you know four or five clock cycles, uh, just because I I, uh, I pipelined all the access uh, to make sure that they were not um, like in the critical path of of, uh, of building the sock and. It, it doesn't matter much because you know a UART is not high bandwidth. The driving the LED is not a high bandwidth peripheral. The SPI is slightly more high bandwidth, but not even that much because I'm using the SPI block that's in the uh, Ultra Plus, um, and it's not that fast. Um, the control interface of the Hyperam is is just used during boot, so you know it's all all kind of stuff where I don't care about the the speed of access. Um, and so our own the cache we developed it speaks switchbone right. But I didn't want to connect it on that bus because it's a slow bus. And so what I did is I modified the bridge to add another wishbone interface which will talk to the cache. And that interface is uh, higher speed. It, it, it doesn't have any weight states and stuff like that. It's basically the same as the VRAM and SPRAM interface. It's uh, basically as fast as is possible with the PyCore interface. Here. There is no, there is no pipelining um, stages, basically. Um, while here, there is uh, there is a bunch of pipeline stage in both direction to uh, break the critical path. So if you do something like this. Um, okay. And so that's what this commit does. I added uh, another wishbone bus uh, that I called the memory cache wishbone, and I mapped it to. Uh, oh wait, I I didn't actually write the address, but I uh, I mapped it to um, zero x four something. Um, yeah, that's not very clear notation, but yeah. Um, basically, if the two MSB of the address is R zero is uh, zero one, then it will talk to this wishbone bus, um, which will be the memory cache and will be our uh, memory, basically, hopefully. Um, okay. Uh, and that's pretty much it. That that commit I actually need to revert because that it's to switch to 128k, but I can't do that if I plug the memory cache because I need the other 64k for the memory cache. So that's what we're starting with. And uh, now what I'm gonna do is actually uh, wire up the cache to this sock and see if that works. Uh, if that does anything. So. Let me switch to no, that's correct. And okay, so I don't need this anymore. Okay. So if you want to look at the code while looking at the stream, you can actually go and check out the branch uh, from Ice Forty Playground. Um, that's in the okay so the first thing I want to do is actually revert this um, so I'm back to 64k let me get the tablet out of the way Okay, so first thing I want to do is include the memory cache core in the build. Uh, 
and then I need to add it to the system so RTL top and then I want uh, course and cash TL MC so we need the core yeah we need the core and the bus adapter right um, this near the memory controller which is somewhere around here dummy memory interface controller yeah okay and then we also want the wishbone um, wishbone adapter thing So if you have any question about what I'm doing, um, don't hesitate to ask in the chat. I'll try to keep an eye on it. Uh, I guess. Uh, but hopefully it should be self-explanatory. Four megabyte of RAM, yeah, so it's only three bits. So this is basically just instantiating the two blocks and wiring them up. Um, should just yeah. so that's the bus adapter. It's gonna connect from the. from the wishbone bus. We added to the um, SOC bridge to the memory cache. So this is clock at 24 megahertz. Uh, let's see if I can actually write a regular expression for this. I try to omit automate things in a uh, in uh, <laughs> in Vim. I sometimes spend more time to use the route to match to the end. Uh, 
Yeah, but I don't think that's the problem because it doesn't match anything at the moment, so... Oh! Yeah, I can do that. No, because I need the name of the signal. What is wrong in this? That should work, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm capturing the the name of the signal because I need to <laughs> to add it at uh, to add it as well. Um, Oh, I need uh, this. Um, yeah, there you go. Ta-da, yeah. <laughs> I always forget if I need to escape them or not. It's just... Um, okay, so I need to look at what the MC bus... So it's uh, <laughs> yeah. Sometimes I spend more time to search how how it works than actually doing it by hand. But one thing I should learn is how to do uh, like macro, like you know, quickly record a macro and execute it at at each line. That's also something useful, but I um, I always forget how this work, uh, how it works. Um, yeah, it's definitely that I agree. It just like here. I mean, I could do the same thing, right? Because all the signals are the same names, almost. So if I do yes. There you go. <laughs> the only difference is apparently I decided to know to name uh Yeah. Yeah, de definitely command history is useful. The thing is I'm pretty sure I have it in the command history of my laptop, but that's my uh, that's my work my workstation, which I use mostly remotely, except when I'm streaming, and so. <laughs> okay, so I think we wired up um, most of the stuff here. It was tapped out here. I just return. Yeah, no, um, I definitely agree, like, having multiple computers, like, for, I think, the last, what, ten, 10 years or something, I've only used my laptop, basically, I've, I've only um, got this workstation a few months ago, and I haven't used it um, all that much locally, I mean, I don't even have, like, a, a proper install yet, it's just a, a, a Ubuntu that I just quickly threw on there, um, And so it's so definitely something that I need to um, 
look at like for instance usually I use this uh, in very log a tab space of four and not eight. Well, all the dot files is not a great um, But yeah, I mean, usually that's what I do for like, like when I use to configure machines like, uh, you know, for work or stuff like that, all the configuration files like the dot vmercy and stuff like that were just in a, um, in a git repo with a script to install them at the right place. Um, and that's something that somewhat works. But because they are distributed a little bit everywhere on the system, um, like for for uh, modern application, I'm gonna say a lot of them have been standardized into going into the the dot config slash and then the name of the application slash stuff like that. But a lot of them still use the old style like dot vim rc or something, and that doesn't work as nicely, um, in my opinion at least. So one thing I need to check is that the, the width of all of the signal is correct because some some things are not obvious. Oh, okay, okay. So I, I uh. I did screw up something. Um, is that on the memory interface, you know, I want the read last and write last signals. Which apparently the memory controller isn't providing. Um, that's because that's something I added after I wrote the, <laughs> the controller. And I think I didn't modify the controller to generate them. So I might have to extend that. So something else that we need to take care of is the the address that's given to the uh, IPRAM controller is 31 bits and that's the exact address that's going to be given to the IPRAM and that's um, not exactly what we want because the address that's given to the hyperram is um, a 16-bit word address and not a 32-bit word address. It's just the, the way the hyperram addressing works. Um, and, and also each hyperram is also only 64 megabits and so it, there is not that many address uh, bits that are actually valid. So what I'm going to do is... Here I'm going to do... 24 bits, which are the 24 correct bit of the address. And to the controller, I'm going to map this directly here. I'm going to map the three upper bits, the two upper bits of the address to the chip select line.
and then here I need 21 to 0 I need to add a bit at the bottom because it's a 20 it's a 16 bit um, address and I want 32 bit address or rather no it's a MI address here is a 32 bit word address and I want a 16 bit word address so I, the last bit is always zero we always align and so e, and I need 32 bits in total and so this is 22 23 so I need nine bits. Um, and I know I don't need to type the nine zero. It's just I just like visualizing what I'm doing. Um, okay, so I think the mapping is correct. The other thing we're gonna do is uh, mi linear equal one b zero. So these these are kind of uh, um, linear is to if you want a linear burst or hybrid burst uh, because the hyperam supports different type of bursts. Uh, it's not something we support in the cache controller. It doesn't matter uh, because well we don't use it. And the other thing is the um, write masking like the the, the hyperam controller supports not writing all the uh, all the bytes in a word, but uh, again, we don't care here. We always want to write full 32-bit words. So I'm going to hardwire that to zero. I'm going to put this... And I think this we can just wire up directly. Okay, so I think our cache is wired. The only thing is that currently our memory controller does not provide those two signals. So we actually need to modify it so that it does provide them because that's kind of uh, that's kind of important. Um, so first, let me add them. No. Okay, then let's modify the memory controller. Hyperram, RTL, HRAM. I thought I had added them, but apparently not. It's kind of a problem. Um, Did I already test the pi curve with the hyperam? Um, well, uh, what I did is not um, not with the hyperam. It's like the pi curve can't read and write from the hyperam itself, but it can talk to the hyperam controller and do the memory training. But that's all it can do basically. Uh, because the thing is, without the cache, there is no way to interface the 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 pi curve v to the hyperram, like the interfaces are just not compatible. We need the cache to actually make the adaptation. Um, and that's what I'm doing now, is basically adding the cache. I did previously add the, uh, like, uh, um, 
Um, I do. Let, let me actually. I can boot the bitstream that I have to show you what it does for the moment. So right, let me plug the um, thing. Oh shit, uh, I have it used somewhere else. Uh... Ah, son of a bitch. Uh, sorry. <laughs> uh... Yeah, I... Okay, so let me restart. So that's the current program that's running on it. And uh, the only thing it does is this, basically. Uh, that's the output of the memory training where it writes um, some bytes on in, the, uh, in the memory and reads them back, but by manually issuing commands. Like, it, if you look at the source code, um, that's done here. So it, uh, to read and write the hyperam, you have to go through these commands, which basically will manually uh, send command to the hyperam um, and uh, and it's sort of like bit banging. It's it's a little more advanced than that, but it's not far from not far from it really. Um, and so the the hyperam doesn't appear as a memory zone for the PyCoreV basically at that point. Uh, but you need to do that uh, at the beginning to initialize the hyperram itself, and then uh, and then we can talk to it. And what I'm doing now is basically uh, like adding uh, this the cache, and the cache will talk. to the hyperam controller that talks to the uh, quad hyperam p mod and the hyperam controller also has a, a slow wishbone interface for the control basically yeah and that's the mem interface Yes, exactly. the The training is uh, is basic. It's two things. First, uh, it's configuring the hyperam because it turns out that the hyperam chips they have configuration registers. Uh, so you configure which latency you want, which type of burst you want, and uh, and that kind of stuff. And so you need to write those registers before you can actually uh, really talk to it. Um, and then the other thing is. Um, Select among you know I showed that you, one of the clock has a, a variable phase, where it's basically finding the right phase to capture the data. Um, in this particular case, because I'm running it only at 48 megahertz, it's not actually that hard to find a phase that works. Um, when I uh, there's another example in the tree that runs it at 72 megahertz, uh, 75 megahertz, something like that. Um, this becomes a little harder, and if you want to run it at 100 megahertz 
or in the faster, like uh, in, the, in an ECP5 running it at 166 megahertz, then it becomes really important to actually um, do the, the training. Um, yeah, that, that, that's what I mean by memory training. Um, let me get back to... Yeah, exactly. The, the code from Kevin is, I mean, first it was running at 12 megahertz and the clock that was sent to the IPRAM itself was one quarter of the system clock, which means you ended up clocking the IPRAM chips at 3 megahertz. Uh, here I'm trying to run them like, you know, uh, up to 75 megahertz. So that's a little difference uh, into uh, what kind of uh, a speed you achieve. And when you're slow enough, yeah, you don't need training. You can just you have ample margin to capture the data. Um, yeah, more bandwidth. Yeah, yeah it, it becomes really a problem um, because the each hyperam chip has a um, viable clock to out delay so you don't exactly know and and that delay is i think up to viable by up to 10 nanoseconds or something um or 8 nanoseconds something like that and so when you have a clock you know a clock of 10 megahertz which means your clock cycle is 100 nanoseconds an uncertainty of 10 nanoseconds it's really no biggie right um uh, when you're trying to run it at 100 megahertz your entire clock cycle is 10 nanoseconds, and you have an uncertainty of 10 nanoseconds, which means you have absolutely no clue where the data is. Um, and so at that point, you need to basically search for it. Um. Yeah, exactly, uh, uh, Piotr. It'd actually be interesting. Uh, I should modify the script so that it, it writes through a CSV or something. So that you can do, uh, so that you can do uh, statistics <laughs> into like how much variation there is and, and stuff like that. But I, I definitely see difference between even even my two boards. Uh, wait. So coming back to this, I need to, so I need to generate the last signal. Um, so that's the code of the IPRAM controller. And I forgot that I, I didn't generate that signal and I need to generate it. And so conveniently I have a signal that's called X for last and so I can um, this oh I'm sorry uh, yeah sorry uh, damn it <laughs> yeah <laughs> I always forget to switch scene I'm sorry um, So I was saying like the the uh, the signal that indicates that the, it's the last data uh, that I'm acknowledging the last write data. I have a signal that's called x for last, so I can just use that. For the read, it's a little more complicated because um. So I don't especially like the way I'm gonna do it, but at least I know it's gonna work. I'm gonna clean that up later. Um, but 
That should do for now. So that's basically the change that I made. I added the two output signals. Wait, I'm missing something here. Oh, yeah. um, one of them is directly the flag that says it's a transfer last and the other is the same flag but delayed by some delay um, because the read is pipeline and stuff like that. And so this, this is just matching the the read pipeline delay. I think that should be correct. Yeah. So I think that should actually maybe work. Did I forget something? I think I'm good, right? So I wired up the wishbone bus interface, I wired it to the wishbone bus and to the uh, interface to the cache. And then I configured the cache connected it up to the bus interface and then connecting connected it up to the memory interface remove the dummy memory interface that was just there to build and connected it to the iPram controller okay so let's see if that builds Wait, what did I do? No, that's not what I wanted to do. Hmm. Ah. So the chances that this is going to work like the first time are like zero, but you know, you can hope, right? Now one issue of wiring up the cache in like this large design is that I'm, I'm not going to see at which frequency it can run because the Pi Core V is going to be the limiting factor. Um, if I wanted really just to, to see at which frequency the cache can run by itself, I would need to wire up the... What the hell? Wow. Honestly, I have no idea how that happened, but I think that's the absolute highest frequency I have ever seen uh, a Pico RV design like pass timing at like 30 megahertz did it trim like half my design or something no it looks fine wow <laughs> no that, that's what I was checking and no that it seems to have added a bunch of logic which I mean, seems logic because, um, you know, uh, but I think that's still pretty, that's still pretty good for what the design contains. I mean, this design basically, it has, um, well, the Hyperam controller, it has, um, so there's the Pi Core V32, it has, 24k of uh, SPRAM, uh, 64k cache. It has the uh, LED IP, so the PW, the, the hardware PWM uh, LED controller. It has the 
SPI hardware controller. It has the USB core, like my USB core is instantiated in there, which means I can run the entire USB stack. Um, Is there a string you can search in the logs to see what's cut out? Unfortunately, not really. I mean, you can, you can search for like trimmed or uh, or um, like instance deleted or something. But the problem is, it's it's a normal thing. Like there are plenty of things that are gonna get removed because I expect them to be trimmed, like bits of registers that I don't use and stuff like that. And so I can't just grab and assume that each of them is an error. I would need to check every single one of them. And the problem is sometimes that happens after logic optimization, which means the name of the signal means absolutely nothing. Uh, so, yeah, knowing what's trimmed is not always easy in front of the lane. But here that doesn't seem to be the case. It seems to have just pass timing just by luck. I don't know how that happened, but that's, that's great news. But uh, So let's program that. Um, shit, that's not what I wanted to do. Uh, did, uh, yeah, it doesn't use less, it, it uses more LUT than before, so that's the good news. Like 3700 is, before I think it used 2700. Um, like the the entire design without the um, without the hyperam controller and without the cache uses uh, less than uh, less than half the FPGA, so it's like two thousand six hundred lots or something. Uh, it's like forty nine percent of the FPGA, and now it uses thirty seven hundred. So the cache and the hyperam controller uses about a thousand lots, and I know the the hyperam controller like. At least 400 lots are used just for the high-speed serializer and deserializer um, because I need to replicate a bunch of logic so that it's close enough to the I.O. pins to be able to run them at high speed, basically. Um, so, so yeah, the, the cache and the hyperam controller is like a thousand lots, which I think is decent um, for the functionality it would provide. But enough talking, let's try to flash this thing. Um, to see if it still even it still boots at all. Um, projects. Um, yeah. So you can't see me, but I, what I'm pressing now is enter on the console and it's not reacting, so it's not doing anything. <laughs> so it's not really, yeah, it's not doing anything. Um, so that's not especially good news. So it, it goes very fast, but it doesn't do anything. So obviously something's wrong. <laughs> um, Let's, well, actually we can just do, first thing we're going to do, let's do it pr somewhat properly and, and uh, actually uh, build a s simulation. I mean, I didn't expect it to work the first time, but I would have at least hoped that it didn't break completely the, uh, the SOC. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Um, that that file isn't actually used, uh, as far as I remember. It, it did find the the boot dot x, which is really all I all I wanted to find. It's the uh, it's the boot code. Uh, it's not gonna go further because uh, the boot code will try to access the hardware SPI IP, which is just not existent. Like it, there is no simulation model for it, so. The only thing I can hope is the, for the boot code to execute in the simulation. After that, it's going to crash anyway. 
Um, it would be great if we had a simulation model for the uh, um, the hardware SPI controller in the uh, in the ice forty, but we don't. So yeah. Uh, but before that, let me actually tr try. So we can enable some things. Um, in the in the firmware to print debugging symbols at various places during the boot process to help see where it where it's crashing. I'm gonna enable that now. Because I updated the boot code, I need to actually rebuild the um, rebuild the firmware. Uh, but the simulation should be done now, so we can at least have a quick look at it to see if we see anything. Oh wait, I need to load. I need to load GTK Wave with a special configuration file, so the font is uh, is bigger, but. I don't remember the option. Uh, dash R. make clean which uh, erase the simulation results <laughs> damn it <laughs> Oh wait, it's running. I th I think I had a. Uh, I think the application code that was in uh, loaded in in here was um, was configured for one hundred twenty eight k of of uh, SRAM and not um, and not sixty four k. So yeah, it's actually running now. I mean, it's not printing anything, but uh, it worked. So if I try the memory training, that's working. Okay. So now we can actually try to read and write to it and see what that does. So we need to add that to the firmware. Uh, Start a new terminal. Um, Thank you. 
So as I said, the mem the uh, hyperam is mapped at uh, this address. Uh, one, two, three, four. So every access to this should be hitting the cache and the hyperam by default. So let's just try to print what's in the in the memory at the. Then let's try to override it. So let's try a basic access. This should uh, point to the hyperam memory mapped in the uh, PyCurve address space. I'm printing the old value, trying to replace it, and then printing the new value. Um, yeah, so what I'm going to do is make it volatile so that, CP, so that the uh, compiler doesn't optimize my access and actually does memory access to, to that address. Wait, what? Did, did I completely forget how to use C? Like, is that what? A label can only what? It's the label volatile. It's a keyword. What the fuck? Somebody will see what I screwed up. Oh, yeah, you're right. It's, I mean, see. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, so I do the memory training and then let's see what... So, nothing. It crashes, which means that uh, wishbone bus access never return. Which is obviously not great. Um, but... At least that gives us something to debug. So let's. So I can't. Uh, there's no way I can um, go that far into into the firmware in the simulation. But what I can do is basically modify the boot code to try and read and write, or just do a write at this address, and then we can see that in the in the simulation. So if I do. Um, I'm just going to add some code here. So I've just added this to the boot code as the absolute first thing the uh, CPU is going to execute. Now obviously, like in reality this could never work because I haven't done the memory training yet and stuff like that, so I can't really talk to the hyperam yet, um, so the write wouldn't succeed, but... Oh... Yeah, you know what? Before I before I actually try to debug that, um, let me try something. 
the Hyperam controller has two modes of operation. It has the configuration mode, where um, where you can do the memory training and stuff like that. And then when the training is done, you switch into runtime mode. And I think I've never switched it to runtime mode, <laughs> which means it never executes the command, which means that would absolutely explain exactly the symptom we, we're, gonna, we're seeing. So I think I'm just going to try that first. Um, Yeah, I need to set that bit to one. Because here I'm configuring it basically, but I never basically tell the controller to actually enable access. And so it's it's not accepting any commands, which means the cache would wait forever, which means this would end, which is exactly what we see. So. Uh, that doesn't mean it's going to work, there might be some other bug somewhere, right? But at this very moment, there is absolutely no chance it's going to work. So let's try this. So we can do the hyperam initialization, and then we can do this. Huh! Wow! That worked! So... It's kind of normal that we read this because I'm reading address zero of the hyperam, and that's exactly the address where I'm doing the memory trading and writing this. So I find the correct old value, which proves to me that the cache actually went to the hyperam and read the value of the hyperam, and um, and did correctly fetch the cache line. And then we wrote a value to it, and we read it back, and it's the correct value. Damn. So let, let's write uh, some quick memory tests, right? Because we've tested access to, an to the entirety of one word of memory. Um, we're supposed to have 64 megabytes. So <laughs> let's try to access a little more than one word. Um, Yeah, let's ship it, right? <laughs> why, why? If the cache is working, it would be transparent. Um, yeah, ideally, you wouldn't never know that the cache is there, right? Or can, or can we actually know if the cache is working? Well, um, huh. You mean that it's actually caching data? Um, good question. <laughs> One thing I definitely want to do uh, at some point is, um, yeah, timing the read would be an option, actually. Yeah, you're right. That would actually be an option. Like, time the first against the second read. Um, yeah, that's a very good idea, Matthew. Uh, that is a very good idea. So what I'm going to do first is... Because by default I disabled the counters in the um, see I disabled the the counters so I'm gonna re-enable them because if I want to time stuff I'm gonna actually need that. Yeah, uh, Peter. Uh, Peter. Um, something I wanted to do is add some logic that basically spy on the. Um, um, on the access bus to see like what percentage of the time the memory uh, the cache is being hit or is being missed to kind of have a, a running average or a running counter of um, how efficient the caching is so I can run um, like a particular workload and see okay yeah that workload it sucks like I miss 90% of uh, thing. exactly cache miss and hit counter that kind of stuff um, 
because to profile stuff, I think that would be insanely useful. Um, and also to test, you know, like, okay, currently I have a four-way cache with 64-byte cache line. Okay, what is the cache, uh, what is the cache hit miss ratio if I go to a two-way cache with 128-byte cache lines? That kind of stuff. Um, I want to know the impact on the performance, on the hit and miss rate, and on the, um, on the, of the size of the core, that kind of stuff. That's, that's why I wanted the core to be somewhat configurable, basically. Um, but um, I'd want to port uh, like a standard benchmark or something. Uh, I think there is something called EM, uh, EM Bench, if I... Like it's a... Uh, some new benchmark thing. Um, and I think that would be a good a good way to run that suite uh, and with different cache configurations and stuff like that. So what I'm gonna do first is just test that I can read and write you know big blocks of memory without knowing if the cache actually works or not. Um, and then I'm gonna test uh, what Matthew uh, suggested with just timing the number of cycles it takes for um, the first read and then the second read. Yeah, that would be an idea too. So let's just test that uh, it actually works for more than one word first, okay? Um, So I have 64 megabyte, which is this much. Um, I th check in, in in the I think in in the PycoSoc repository I think there is some I th I don't think it's Cormark I think it's Drystone uh, but I think I think uh, uh, Claire uh, tried to run it on the uh, on the Pico RV and I think on uh, on the on on her GitHub there is some code for that. I haven't tried myself, but that's definitely think. Uh, uh, so that looks like a basic benchmark, right? Uh, not benchmark. Um, thing. So I minute. That still works. Of 
course, due to my very smart benchmark, I have no idea if it crashed or if it's just taking long. Yeah, that was dumb. Um, maybe I should add some status. <laughs> okay, so... Not great. What well, didn't crash, that's a start. Um, but it didn't work either. So first, let's just... Make it smaller. So it's faster, and then... That should be... Um, Okay, so that actually worked for the beginning of the memory. So I'm actually curious to see when is the first time it fails. It's running, I'm gonna go grab something uh, else to drink. Okay, so it failed at a pretty far away aligned address. So my guess as I either I've screwed up uh, well let's what is that address um, huh That's eight megabyte. Okay. So basically only the first chip works. It's like the first eight megabyte, which is the first 64 megabits, which is the first um, the first hyperam chip. Right? So obviously I have something that's screwed up probably in the memory controller and not at all in the cache um, wait do I yeah I do have the fully populated uh, um, <coughs> uh, so I'm gonna have a quick look if I can if I can see uh, what would not be working um, for the other chip select lines but since it's most likely a problem in the hyperam controller and not in the cache I might just move on for now because I have a, a, a micro python uh, port that I would like to run off the hyperam and I think that's more interesting than uh, debugging a chip select issue in in the hyperam controller because um, uh, 
So, I mean, that seemed reasonable. What is the address width? I don't remember if it's in bytes or if it's in uh... The problem with addresses is that sometimes there are byte addresses so and sometimes there are word addresses and uh, sometimes I screw things up um, That's why usually I try to write documentation did I? Okay, so it explicitly says word addresses, so 24 is 64 megabytes, so it should be it should be 24. All right, that's yeah, so that's correct. Yeah, so that looks correct too. Um, hmm. Let's check the um, the user's logs. If uh, it's not always. Uh, I mean, there is 10,000 lines of log, right? So, um, spotting something wrong. Oh, wait, I think you can't even see. Yeah, it's under my cursor, but uh, there is 10,000 lines in, the, in that file. So, no, I'm searching for the chip select because, um, like, if, if you look at. Uh, like the output of the test, it says it files at this address, and that address is the very first address of the second chip, which you know seems like a bit of a coincidence. So it's most likely the chip select logic that fails somehow. Uh, I don't know how, but <laughs> that's most likely what's happening is that um, it's not accessing the right chip. But what's weird is that it did. At hmm. Or no chip at all, yeah, yeah. Um, that's actually something I'm, I'm gonna test right now, is I'm gonna set the um, highest bit to something all the time, because I want to know if that zero is, it accessed the wrong chip, like it addressed the first chip instead of the first one, or if it wrote the wrong value, or, yeah. So, what I'm gonna do is... This... D 
did I run the test code? Yeah, I've run, uh, I mean, I've, I've didn't run it on stream, but I've run it on. Uh, I've run it on this board and on this on this exact P mode, so I know the. Um, the chip works. Okay, so it's it's reading zero, so it's it's. Uh, it's not reading anything basically. And I can, um, or let me grab another board. So I do have another P mod, which uh, I don't know if you can see, but uh, it only has one of the chip populated. Like these three are not populated, and there is only one chip populated. So I can use, if I put that instead, and I run the training program, you can see that, uh, yeah, only one of the chip select actually works. Like this works, and all the three others are just crap, basically. And if I put back the... Uh, the correct one, then all the chips select work properly. Yeah, exactly. Um, why that would be? It's a good, and it's not accessing the first chip because else I would be reading the. Uh, the value, so it's just not accessing anything. And so that's why I wanted to check, um, try to check the... <laughs> See if there was a warning on, on, a, on an address line or something, like that would have the wrong width or something. Because, I mean, uh, a possibility is that uh, the, the width of one of the signals... That's something that's annoying in Verilog, is that it converts between width, uh, of, or between signal of different widths, kind of silently. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm here I'm just searching in a... In Vim for uh, address. Uh, remove the nine, the top nine bits from top mem control. See, that's a problem, right? Because if I remove nine bits out of thirty two. There's not enough left. Oh, no, 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 never mind. That's in the memory controller. That's no, okay, that's fine. That's block RAM. Okay, so I didn't see anything searching for that. I can try to see. 
search for warning. This is fine, that's fine, and that's... Yeah, there's really not that many warnings. Uh... Yeah. So yeah, no warning. Mm, okay. So what else could it be? Well, you know what? Let's use the simulation. Okay, I mean, that's what it's for, right? Uh, and we didn't use it for debugging the other issue, so we can use it for this one. Let's me just... Let's issue a right to zero zero to this address. But before that, we actually need to switch the controller to runtime mode. And the controller is at this address. So the, um, this command should switch the um, IPRAM controller to runtime mode so we can issue commands. And this should issue a write to the address that's fading here. And we can see what happens. might be easier than randomly trying stuff. I was looking if um, this was throwing any warning or something. Okay, so the simulation is done. Let's. Did I have. What? No. That's not at all just what I wanted to load. Uh... So let's try to find our memory accesses. <clears throat> so this is the um, all that all the signal that start by mem. So like uh, all of these uh, that's like the raw PyCore AV memory bus um, and so we should see it fetching instruction and then doing the actual 
uh, memory access. So here we can see a right, a right um, access to the HyperAM controller, which is enabling the runtime mode. And then here we can see our write access to the um, hyperam. which gets acknowledged here but it takes a long time because it, it needs to load the cache line Wait, what, is it, what is it doing it should load the cache line that's the first thing it should do Yeah, that's what it does here. That's the memory interface, and we can see that it um, issues a command, and the command gets issued to the wrong address. Oh, that's just wrong. No, 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 never mind. Um, I want to see the memory controller this. These two signals. And it is wrong. Does anybody, is there a way to move several signals at once? It's kind of annoying to have to. I mean, here the address is still, the chip select is still zero, which is, it is not correct. That address should be corresponding to um, chip select one. So I screwed up my address mapping, basically. Um, how is that? Let me just... Let me run to the address bank. Well, yeah, I'm an idiot. What the fuck? I... I said that I have a 64 megabyte address space which would mean catch four chips of 16 megabytes, right? Well, okay, my, my handwriting is terrible, but you can more or less read. Well, except the chips, the chips are 64 megabits, which is eight megabytes. Like, <laughs> okay, so yeah, I just can't do math. So let's change the memory mapping <laughs> to actually um, map the correct 32 megabytes of RAM we have and not 64. Yeah, <laughs> the thing is, all, all the default value are 64 megabytes because in the future what I want to do is have 32 megabytes mapped of hyper RAM and then 32 megabytes mapped of flash. And so that's why I, I decided to have a complete address space of 64 megabytes, but the hyperam itself is only 32 megabytes. Um, so let's go and fix that. Uh, okay. So this is twenty two point 
to 21, 20, and 10 bit. Okay, I want this to work. Um, oh wait, I need to switch the scene again. Yeah, 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 I just I, I noticed um, when looking at uh, at my laptop, uh, I I need to keep an eye on that. But I need to disable the screen server on my laptop so that I always see what's actually appearing on the stream. I think that would be a good idea. Oh, we instantly lost like four megahertz of speed. <laughs> okay, never mind. Way, way too fast. Um, so of course I need to also... Wait, no, I'm an idiot. Um, I need to rebuild it because <laughs> I added like this code in the boot code, but of co obviously I need to remove it before I can actually run it on real hardware because that code will just crash the uh, memory controller on real hardware. Um, Well, actually, it didn't crash it, but okay. Yeah, I mean, it's it's, it's really just the seed. The fact that one of the seed passed at thirty megahertz means the design should be able to pass. I could just. Can I explain this? Like, oh yeah, sure. Um, as soon as I got one, uh, let me see if it, uh, it finished building. Okay, when it's finished building, I will um, try to explain what it means. In the meantime, what I wanted to do is change the uh, the mem test to only test thirty two megabyte of RAM. Suspense, will it work? I should have print like success or something because here it's just gonna if it succeeds it's just gonna print nothing. Which is a bit anticlimactic or something, but uh, whatever. Drumming intensifies, yeah. And it works! Beautiful. Oh that's pretty good. Really happy with that. Um, so let's see the, yeah, ooh, thanks, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> pretty happy that it works on the, on the hardware, like pretty much first time, like we had real, real change to make and they were in the memory controller and not even the, in the, in the cache controller. I mean, we still don't know if the caching really works, but it seems reasonable, right? So the histogram, okay, so that's the timing histogram and what does it mean? Um, so here you have kind of the, the legend, um, and that means that, every, so the way timing analysis works, um, let me switch on this, the way timing analysis works is it looks at every single path of combinatorial logic 
and looks at the maximum delay between the uh, output of a register and the input of the next one, right? That's how timing analysis works, and that's how it determines the uh, the f max here, like the uh, maximum frequency for clock. If you look at uh, the timing report, you will see um, critical pass for clock 24 megahertz. That's the output of that particular flip flop, and then all the combinatorial logic and the lots it goes through until the input of the next flip-flop. So this flip-flop is uh, this one and the first one here is that one and all the intermediate steps, that's all of this stuff. And it computes the delay, right? And from 16.4 plus 20.8 and you do the like inverse of that, that will give you uh, your maximum frequency, which here is 26.93 megahertz. Okay. And it analyzes all those paths, compare them with all the uh, constraints that you have set for the various clocks, and it builds that histogram. And that's every single, I mean, each, you know, the plus represent 26 path. And uh, the star, no, the star represents 26 paths, and the plus represents between 1 and 26 paths. And it basically tells you um, how close to the maximum limit uh, is your design. And so, basically, if we look at this line, we have like, you know, 26 times 3 or 4, so like something like about 100 paths that have somewhere between. Uh, 600 picosecond and 4.5 nanoseconds of slack. And the slack, that's the difference between um, the maximum delay that's tolerable to meet your target frequency and um, and the actual delay. That means that for about 100 path, we could still add somewhere here, add more logic for up to, you know, between 600 picosecond and 4.5 nanosecond. And then we have more paths that have somewhere between 4.5 nanoseconds and 8.5 nanoseconds of timing margin, um, and so on and for, so forth for all the, all the lines. And basically, when you have very few uh, paths on this line, on the first line, uh, what it means is that basically you design has very few critical paths, and if somehow you can solve those, you will be able to increase the frequency. If, on the other hand, like the first line here, uh, the first line here uh, was like super long, you know, that would mean that there is a, a lot of paths that are very critical and very close to the maximum frequency already. And that means that if you want to increase the frequency, you're gonna do, you're gonna need to optimize like a lot, a lot of things. Well, no, it's kind of the opposite. Like the, if the bulge is lower, that means that there is more path with more margin, which means that it's gonna be easier to optimize, basically. Uh, yes. All those values are the difference between the maximum delay that's tolerable for your target frequency and uh, the delay that's actually been achieved. I mean, it computes all the paths and it generates, a, it generates an histogram um, where it segments all the, all the paths into like 20 bits or something. Uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So yeah, it computes all the, all the delay of all the paths and then segments it in 20 bits of approximately the same size. So the exact value here is they're not uh, based on the constraint themselves. They're based on you know what the measured pass delays are, basically. Yeah, exactly. The bigger the value, the more margin you have. If the value here is negative, 
That means that you have negative margin, which basically means your timing doesn't, your design doesn't meet timing. Um, and that can, that can actually be useful because if you have like a very small value here, like assume that your design doesn't meet timing and you have like minus 300 and then, and you only have like a few paths, that means that your design is actually very, very close to meeting timing and you don't have many paths to fix. If on the other hand, you have like very huge negative values here, that means that you, you're nowhere even close of meeting your timing. Uh, and so you can pretty much give up and, and, and run your design at the slower speed. Yeah, I mean, it, like interpreting the the the, uh, the histogram is um is very important to have a a, a good um, a good idea of you know how close you are to actually meeting your specs. Um, something that would be very useful, but that's unfortunately not um, possible at the moment, is it would be useful to oh, currently next piano only only prints the the longest one yeah it just print one path uh which is the the critical path what would be useful is for instance to have like the the top 10 or something that would be that would be very good um yeah because one path is not always representative of where you actually need to work um to improve the design yeah of every way to dump them yeah that that'd be useful exactly that that would be um I think actually uh I think Eddie um um wor is, is working on something like that to dump the path to a dot file with the timing info. Um but it generates like a super huge graph because it exports all the path. Uh, I would only export like the top ten or the top n um path again. Um, so what, I'm wondering what to do now, um, should I add some, uh, timing measurement to measure if the cache is actually doing some work, like, uh, like Matthew suggested, um, or alternatively I can try to run MicroPython of the Hyperam. Okay, timing measurement it is. Sure. I I definitely I'm definitely gonna do both at some point, but uh um let's do the timing measurements. That should be also not too long I think. Oh wait, I should uh, go to this. So I need to know how to time stuff. And if I remember correctly, There is some form of benchmarking code somewhere in there, right? Ah, yeah, this thing. Uh, read cycle and read in threads. Uh, 
Okay. So each cache line is 64 bytes. So if I do access to um, space by 64 bytes, so something like um, 64 bytes is 16 words. So each of those access should basically be hitting a different cache line, which means that every time it's going to have to load the cache line, which is, should be slow and measurable. I'm going to do that for 256, wait, do I have 256 cache line? Uh, so the size of the cache is four ways. Uh, 64K, four ways, 16, one, two, uh, 64 bytes. So I do have 256 cache lines, so that's perfect. That should basically fill every single cache line of one way of the cache. So the, um, the ASM line, well, it's reading a hardware counter. So the, the RISC-5 uh, has special instruction where you can read a hardware counter that counts the number of cycles and the number of instructions that have been executed. And so these uh, is executing uh, like this particular assembly uh, RISC-5 assembly instruction that's loading those hardware counters. So that's going to tell me you know, how many cycles have passed, clock cycles, and how many instructions have been uh, executing. Yeah, you have to use uh, assembly because uh, yeah, they are hardware instruction. I don't. You can't access them from C. Uh, naturally, there is no C standard for that. Uh, I don't know. Um, uh, I would have used T, but. <laughs> It's already um, already used for test. <laughs> PQST, yeah, let's see you. Yeah. Okay, that 
works. So that's the first time I executed, which should have primed the cache. Um, and you can see that it actually, you know, it, it took an average of... Yeah, an average of like 11 cycles to execute each, each instruction. Now drum roll, we'll see if uh, it gets better. And it does. So the number of instructions stays the same, right? That's kind of expected. Uh, And I did speed it up. No, um, of course. Well, that's actually really weird. Uh, One thousand two. The number of instructions seems high to me. Because it's a it's a. Um, I mean, there's 256 access. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, I think I'm going to do that to, just to see exactly um, um, what it's doing because that there's 256 access. That means that there is actually only... There's only five instructions per loop, which is not that bad, I guess. And if I execute it a second time, yeah, that's pretty much stable. Uh, but I have still uh, disassembled it to see exactly um, the code for that loop. Um, let's do that. Now what I'm going to test after is uh, try to see if the multi-way works. Like if, uh, because if I hit several cache line in the same, um, sorry, several memory locations. Uh, that hit the same cache line, but in different ways, that should still have the same uh, performance benefit, basically. Um... So that's the loop. Twenty one five sorry. Well, so yeah. We have one, two, three, four, five instruction per cycle plus three or four depending on, on the uh, uh, the read instruction rates. So that's pretty much consistent with the numbers. Of course, the only instruction that got sped up by the cache is, is this instruction, right? All the other, they're not accessing the memory. So it's not, um, it wasn't sped up at all by the cache, which means that really, um, We had uh, uh, 256 instruction that were previously taking nearly 14,000 cycles. So there was 54 cycles per instruction uh, per fetch. I mean, which.
So how many? So we won. That's six thousand cycles for two hundred fifty-six cash line fetch, which means it took about twenty-five cycles to fetch a cash line. Cash line is sixty-four uh, bytes, which is sixteen word, which means it's gonna take sixteen uh, cycles for the actual transfer of the data. Press the command latency, which is two. Press the capture latency, which is four. So yeah, it seems more or less consistent with what I expect. Like, um, the memory controller is gonna take about 22, probably 23 cycles because we need to actually latch the command to execute the fetch. And the cache took 25 cycles. So that's pretty much consistent with what I would expect. That's nice. So let's try now with um, multiple uh, access access to different ways. So here we basically fetch one cache line per per way. Um, if I do times four, this. This should basically load every single way because we, we will have cache line conflicts and it should load them in different way which means we, we should still see the about the same gain. I mean of course it's going to be four times as long because I'm accessing four times as much data but uh, the cache should still work fine. I mean it should always work fine but I mean the, we should still see the, the same performance gain that's what I mean. So that's the first access, and that's the second access, and we see that the number of uh, cycles is about divided by two, and it's stable. So the four ways work. And now here, if I go to eight, this should completely trash the cache, which means that we shouldn't see any difference between different execution because we're basically constantly replacing all the cache lines and so uh, we won't have any benefits from the cache whatsoever. And so that's the first access. It's interesting that the Subsequent access are actually slower. Oh, uh, yeah, of course, they're slower. Because the first access, the cache lines are not valid. And so we don't need to flush them. But for the access after that, not only do we need to reload the data that we want, we also need to write back the actual data that got written. So it's, it costs even more because we need to... We need to fetch the, the data from memory, but we also need to write back the data that's actually been written. But after that, it seems consistent. Right? So it operates as expected. I'm pretty happy with that. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I am very happy with that. Thank you. Yeah, I think I'm going to stop now because um, I'm not going to have uh, any time to play with MicroPython really um, today. So, I don't know. Um, it, I don't know if people think it would be interesting to see me trying to run MicroPython on, on, on that uh, for next stream or if I just stop, stop there. Okay. Yeah. Sure. I can. I can. Uh, I can stream again and um, and try to do that. Um, if people think that that'd be interesting. Sure. Okay. Well. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, everyone. Um, for
for joining the stream. Uh, if you want, I will uh, um, push the changes and the fixes to the repository, so all the code is um, it's on GitHub on my in in my uh, ice forty um, ice forty playground repository in a, in a, in the dev branch. You'll find all the code that I've been working on on, on this stream. I will push the changes that I just made um, to it. And and if you want to replicate it, uh, well, you need uh, an icebreaker and a and a quad P mod and a quad uh, hyperam P mod. You you should be able to do uh, small changes to run it on the single P mod as well. That uh, shouldn't be much of an issue. Um, yeah. Yeah, good night, uh, Matthew. Uh, I will uh, probably go to sleep uh, soon as well. It's like uh, midnight and 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 here. So. Oh, cool, Piotr. Yeah, I'll definitely uh, tune in to, uh, for that. You're finally ready to uh, uh, show off the the work you've done on the lighting stuff. Looking forward to that. Well. Thanks, guys. Um, as usual, I will up up upload the stream to um, YouTube for the archives. And uh, feel free to subscribe on YouTube if you want to uh, f uh, see the archives. Or uh, follow me on Twitch if you want to be notified of uh, future streams. Bye, everyone.